Okay. Okay, so we will call to order this meeting of the Curriculum and Instruction Subcommittee. If I could ask the clerk to please call the roll. Chairperson Martin? Here. Ms. Del Rossi? Here. Ms. Thompson? Here. Three present. Excellent. We also have an attendance. Ms. Doherty, another member of the school committee. I don't have the actual uh, agenda in front of me, so I'm not sure which goes first. Can we start? I'll just the Go right ahead. So first we'll hear from Ms. Desmond. Thank you. Uh, so tonight we are having a follow-up uh, subcommittee meeting to um, listen to the director of special ed, Frank Vicente's uh, report on his findings after uh, spending some time at the LeBlanc and uh, following his presentation, we have updates uh, that were requested from Lowell High around um, integrating fine arts with health and then also um, Jill Rothschild is here, the assistant head of schools, to provide an update around the possibility of phys ed uh, being uh, substituted for some sort of athletics within um, the Lowell High School overall program. So we'll start with um, Dr. Vicente. I will just say as Dr. Vicente comes up to the podium, uh, we do have a hard stop tonight at about five of six because there's another meeting coming in. So I would just, I know we have some um, members of the public who want to speak, we want to hear from everybody, but just asking if everyone can be as succinct as possible so we can get through both, both topic right. areas. Thank you. Go right ahead. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. So as Ms. Deb uh, Ms. Desmond said, I'm here um, as a follow-up to our January 24th meeting. Um, had a conversation with you folks uh, in regards to the LeBlanc School. Um, at that time, I had indicated that I felt like to address um, the, the matters that were at hand, the best thing for me to do was to start to take a real comprehensive look at the school, gather some more information. So that's what I've been working to do. And I'm happy to provide an update tonight and tell you where we're at in the process. Okay? So, you know, I'm just going to go right through this. Um, you know, we'll go over an overview of staffing levels, enrollment, programming. Um, I'll talk a little bit about my own observations, um, conversations with staff, some generalized recommendations, and then next steps. Okay? All right. So um, current staffing is listed on the slide. Uh, we have the day school coordinator, Ms. Carolyn Cuneo is here tonight. She's the coordinator of the Blank Therapeutic Day School. Um, seven special education teachers. One of our teachers, Sharon Bizantz, is here as well tonight. Six paraprofessionals, a social worker, a school security guard, the school clerk, custodian, 0.5 nurse, 0.5 BCBA uh, for a total of 19 building positions. All right. Uh, the position of BCBA is shared. It's a shared position with Lowell High School, um, as we previously discussed. Um, the position of BCBA has really been the prime um, discussion that we've had in regards to January 24th taking a look at that, um, the model, and thinking about the best supports for the school. Um, and then I also wanted to just add in here a statement about transition. So it's important to acknowledge that the LeBlanc is a 766 public day school, and we fall under the guise of 766 and making sure that we're meeting all of our obligations, um, including the work that needs to be done around transition. So after 14 years old, we start working towards transition planning and thinking about what are the important next steps when they leave high school because by definition from special education high school graduation is the equivalent to a change in placement so what we want to do is as we're thinking about that transition into adult life we want to make sure that we've covered our bases that we've done the things that we need to do to prepare our students for that transition for that change in placement and make sure that we're doing our due diligence so that we provide the best outcomes for them okay Okay, so I was reviewing staffing information and talking about um, transition, so I'm gonna move on. So components, primary pro components of the program, um, we have the school coordinator. She's overseeing the daily operations of the building, um, social emotional support to ensure special education compliance, and then she serves as the instructional leader of the building. We have our seven classrooms. Each of the classrooms has a special education teacher, and then we have the um, paraprofessionals that support them. So the schedule is set up so that we can accommodate staffing for lunches and for their, you know, preps that they're, they get under the UTL contract. We have the school social worker. Um, so she does social emotional supports, case management, family community outreach, crisis management, social skills groups, 
um, and then she's a member of the evaluation team. We have the BCBA, so they support the behavior analysis needs of the students. They do data collection practices, um, working with systems, different types of data analysis, um, coaching and modeling in class supports, and they also work on functional behavioral assessments. Um, they have a school security guard, so he offers behavioral supports. Um, he also contributes to the daily operations of the building, um, and he's also one of our district trainers for crisis prevention intervention. So CPI is the training that uh, many of our staff go through for de-escalation and crisis management, all right? Um, so they work off of a point and level system. That's one of their primary um, accesses as far as data collection and making determination about how the students are progressing through their day um, and moving forward. They have some established committees. They have a data team. Um, the BCBA is overseeing their data team. They have a clinical team that the social worker is working with. And then they have their crisis team um, that the school security guard is working with as well. Okay. So I included a copy of their master schedule. So the model uh, historically has been that they work on getting their content areas in the first half of the day. Um, it's the belief of the school that that's where they have the highest access points for their students in terms of their emotional availability, their regulation, um, the academics, so they tailor the day that day, and then they have their afternoon where they go to more of their electives. All right. So the enrollment information I believe I provided last time, uh, current enrollment, 42 students. Um, you know, being a public, public day school, the, the enrollment does fluctuate from time to time. Um, they've got an average daily attendance right now of about 19 students, and then they have 10 students that have some modification of their day through their IEP. All right. So the days that I was present at the school, so I've had a mix of days being over there were days where I spent the entire day there, um, days that I've gone in in the morning, times that I've been in the afternoon. Um, just really focused on observation. I've been meeting with different staff members. I've had conversations with them. Much of my conversations with the staff, with the teachers, has really just been about what do you need? What do you need? What level of support have you gotten up to this point? Um, I've had a lot of questions that I wanted to ask them about the instructional supports around the building um, and just to kind of get a sense of where they're at in that point. You know, I think that I, going back to January, one of the things that's really important to me is that we acknowledge that they get the same access points as everybody else. They get the same level of supports as everybody else in the city. And so I really wanted to hear from them and have a conversation about what's been made available to them and making sure that we're doing our due diligence with that. Um, we've also included some additional BCBA support. So because the position um, has been shared with Lowell High School, we identified the days that the BCBA is not present, and I have another BCBA that's been coming in on those days so that we have people present there. Um, so what I have said to the school is that we were going to keep that in place through April vacation and then sort of make an assessment from there. And I just recently spoke with Ms. Cuneo and I let her know that I'd like to talk to her this week about what the spring looks like and you know, certainly make sure that we're prepared to continue to offer the appropriate level of support to the school. All right. So some just generalized observations since I've been there. Um, there were five incidents that resulted in suspension. Um, most of the incidents happened in the afternoon. They were there on days when the BCBA was present. Um, in talking to the BCBA who's been offering additional support, um, it's my understanding that she's had some conversation with Ms. Cuneo and a couple of things that she's pointed out is reviewing the master schedule. I think that that's a pretty standard practice and making sure that the master schedule lends itself to the best opportunities for the students. Um, whether that is to continue with the current model and trying to um, reinforce academics earlier in the day or if there's anything that would fluctuate from that. Um, she was asking questions about whether or not the, the lunch model is effective, thinking about transitions and thinking about transitional times and unstructured times for students. Um, you know, where are the points in the day when we were looking at students where they're moving and when they're not moving and what's happening with them to try to identify some target times if it would benefit to make any adjustments to those things. Uh, an interesting observation that she, she had made was around the building acoustics. Um, the building's loud 
And so she had indicated that, you know, it's a loud building and not because of volume, meaning that because of the kids are loud, just the nature of the structure of the building. And so she had asked the question is, have we ever considered the acoustics and thought about the sensory needs of our kids, given that these kids have a disability? Is there anything that we need to do to consider? Would it make any sense to think about the building acoustics? Um, and this, some generalized conversations about the role of the BCBA, the practice of the district, um, the job description, the expectations around the BCBA work and what's been happening at the LeBlanc School, and really getting to the heart of the matter of what are the most appropriate supports for the LeBlanc School. And that's really been my focus in this process, as I've thought about the comprehensive needs of the building, really looking at everything and trying to ask myself and ask everyone you know that's involved what's the best way to provide the most comprehensive supports to the school universally okay so um, I reviewed some records I've read student IEPs um, I've met with staff I've walked around and done some observations um, some of the different things that we've already to put we've already put in place since January we have the additional BCBA support that's been going in um, we've made contact with Officer Paul Robbins, so he is a city SRO. Um, so we, were, we learned that he had um, the availability to go and visit the school, so we wanted to make sure that everybody had his contact, given that there's been the change with the SRO model. So we want to make sure that, you know, not even the Little Blank School, that everybody is fully aware that we have that availability for Officer Robbins, all right? Um, 21st century after school program funding. So um, I had some conversations with Carolyn Rochelot. One of the questions that I had for Ms. Cuneo and the staff was about after school programming and what's been available to after school programming. And one of the barriers that was identified was transportation. So I was able to have a conversation with Ms. Rochelot, look at what's available for 21st century, and we are able to fund out an after school program that, I don't know, have you guys started yet? Or is it starting? April 5th, that will start. Um, we make sure that they have full funding for that. We make sure that they have transportation in that. Um, the staff themselves have, you know, been enthusiastically uh, willing to participate. Um, we've worked out an, an arrangement with North Reading Transportation regarding, regarding access to a bus. And they actually have a staff member there who has a 7D license. So they are working on some creative ways to make sure that not only do they have the ability to get the kids home, but we can also look at, can we take them places beyond just having them there at the LeBlanc School? So that's what they've been working on. I believe it's the, called the Adventure Club, the LeBlanc Adventure Club, is that what you guys are referring to? Program was flat. Yeah, and so they're looking to put it together and get them out and about and around the city and, and gain some experiences for the kids. And I'm, you know, I'm really excited to hear that they're taking that opportunity and building in some programmatic incentives for the kids, all right? Um, so Purple Tail Farms Equine Assisted Therapy Program, so this is just a, a colleague of mine, so she is a therapist and she does equine assisted work, so when I was a principal at the Laura Lee, she actually brought horses to the Laura Lee School, so I put them uh, in contact with her, and I reached out to her this week to see where they were at in the process, and she said that they were working on the details as far as getting in contact with her, but somebody that I would like to, I can, the Laura Lee kids were just, you know, beside themselves when they had horses over there at the school, so hopefully that will be able to offer them that as well. Um, I also met myself and my assistant director, Alexis Florence. Um, so we met with Carrie Occasion from DESE, and I was asking her about career development programming and work-based learning models. Um, that's something that I have in here in the presentation that I'm gonna talk a little bit more, but I really wanted to think about some of the work that's happening already in LeBlanc and what can we do to extend that and maximize the use of those programmings to support the kids, again, thinking about the transitional work, okay? Um, so in next month, we'll be doing some instructional rounds. Um, Carolyn and I had a conversation with Melissa Newell from the ELA department. We're working on setting up some time with Jeff Guiazda as well, and we're hoping to go to the building, set up some time that we can physically walk around, take a look at the pedagogy, talk a little bit about the resources they have and continue that work to be able to support the building instructionally. All right. So as far as recommendations at this point, and I, I want to reiterate that my recommendations, this is a con continuously living and working document. Um, I wanna continue to work with staff closely 
about the things that are going to be the most important and impactful supports for the building. All right. So um, a su support staff review and determination of positional needs, thinking about their instructional needs, the social, emotional, and behavioral supports for the school, and outreach and transition planning. Those are the things that stuck out to me based on my observations. I want to make sure that I hear from the staff as well about where they're at in those things, but really give some thought to the positional needs of the building, the support needs of the building, and what's that best look like? What's going to give the building exactly what they need to be able to offer the most amount of support to our students? Um, pedagogy and curriculum review, supported by Melissa Newell and Jeff Guiazda from the curriculum department. I want to continue that work with them, take a look at the instructional practices in the building, take a look at the different resources that they have. I know that staff had indicated to me that they would be very much open and welcome to having the opportunity to have some more access to those conversations, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, I would like to see development of a true uh, instructional committee. I want to continue from that work that we can really hone in on making sure that we're meeting all of our obligations under the IEP, including, you know, the instruction. Um, you know, it's, I always say, and I, I think about my own experience when I was at the Laura Lee School, that I always needed to make sure that I prioritized for myself that we we're a school first above everything else, and so I always want to make sure that the instruction is at the forefront of everything that we're doing. All right. Um, I'd like to see some professional development work around high leverage practices and evidence-based practices specific to students with emotional disabilities. It's a very highly specialized form of education and I want to do my due diligence to be able to support their initiatives to gain access to as much as they can to be able to support the students to move forward. Um, I want to continue to work with them on their IEP development, on transition planning, and then data collection systems and progress monitoring um, from multiple data points. Um, meeting with administration, BCBAs regarding data analysis, review, current findings and recommendations. Um, I want us to be able to sit down together and have some more conversations about what we've seen up to this point over the spring, what's been happening, and really put our heads together about any additional recommendations that make sense moving forward. All right. Um, review of system practices for attendance, for student engagement, and program incentives. Um, I think that the, the work around the after school programming is going to be a, a really important part of that. Um, I think as we think about our curriculum practices and instruction and the professional development around high leverage practices, what can we do to continue to support this, the level of engagement for kids to really take ownership of their learning and continue to move forward with that? Um, and talk about attendance. I want to make sure that we do the work that we need to do around supporting attendance. Um, I, I think it's really important to me that the district offers the appropriate level of support to LeBlanc School about addressing any concerns with attendance. All right, so, um, you know, I put an attendance data in here because it's an important initiative for me. Um, the attendance is definitely something that we want to take a close look at and make sure that we're offering the right level of support around that. Um, there are as a variety of reasons why students miss school, and I want to make sure that as a district, we're doing all the different things that we can to address the attendance needs of the school and make sure, again, that we are doing our due diligence. Um, and then the work, -based, <clears throat> the work study program based on the Massachusetts work-based learning plan model. So I've had um, some conversations with Lowell High School, with Dr. Rothschild, um, to get a little bit of understanding about the different opportunities that are available through a work-based learning model. So, I mentioned earlier in the slide that there are some students that have modifications to their day, all right? And so there are a group of students at the LeBlanc School that in the afternoon they transition to a job, all right? And their IEPs are written at such to allow them to do that. Um, with regard to that, when we're making modifications to the IEPs traditionally, what we're essentially saying is that because of the disability, we have to make a modification to the student's learning plan. And what I think we could take a look at is to develop a comprehensive work-based learning program there that's similar to the model that was given to me by carrying occasion from the state around lining these kids up in the afternoon with jobs, 
so that they can get both high school credit and have the job where they can get the incentive of being paid, okay? And I would like to be able to do that. They can get elective credits that way. Um, that way we don't necessarily have to modify their day through the IEP because again, what we're saying through the IEP is because of their disability, their day has to end at a certain period of time and I would rather them be able to use those afternoon times where they can continue to get credits in addition to get a job and get paid because in, in my viewpoint, that, that in itself is a high leverage practice for building incentives for the kids to be able to come to school. All right. So I have the series of attendance data. Um, I mentioned the data in here. Um, I've included the chronic absence rate. Um, so from the, the uh, attendance office, they gave me a five-year breakdown of the chronic absence rate for the school. Um, so most recently with COVID, we're talking about 28% of the absences are COVID-related. So I think that it's important to note that. Um, but again, from my viewpoint, in thinking about the work that goes into the school, I want to make sure that as a district, myself as a special education director, that I'm doing my due diligence to offer as much support as I can from my department, from the attendance office, from everybody involved to support the initiatives and get everybody to come to school, right? That's our goal. Um, I think that's a really important goal. And, um, oh, I also did include the, the current attendance document that Little Blank has been using, all right? And so I want to work with the model that they have and continue to build out a, a robust plan of support around attendance, okay? Um, so at the end, so if, as far as next steps, I think it's important to do some more strategic planning sessions with building administration, with Ms. Cuneo, um, talk about that staffing review. But I think the third one is going to be really important um, LeBlanc School Stakeholders Working Group. I want to get people together, the people that have a vested interest in the school, the staff, Ms. Cuneo, and talk about what are the universal needs of the building, how do we work to make sure that the students are getting what they need academically, what needs to happen to make sure that the building is safe, make sure that everybody has a welcoming environment and that we put everything we can um, forward to help them continue to grow and succeed, all right? Um, the instructional rounds with Melissa Newell, with Jeff Guiazda, and I think that will continue to expand out to uh, maybe some of the low high school staff in regards to like the department chairs. I, I wanna see where that goes from the recommendations of Ms. Newell and Ms., uh, Mr. Guiazda, um, and then continue to work on the work-based learning model, okay? Um, so one thing that I wanted to close with, so in special education, our performance is based on the 20 indicators, all right? So under our expectations through IDEA, we get measured on our indicators. Indicator 14 is post-secondary school outcomes. So I've just recently touched base with the special education department at Lowell High School and with the LeBlanc School about getting them the paperwork to start putting us in position to collect indicator 14 data for the current graduates so that we have it in place moving forward. The goal for indicator 14 is to have that data so that we can track post-secondary outcomes in the coming years, in the next few years, to see what kids are doing, all right? And find out how many kids we have that are going to college, find out how many kids that are working, find out, you know, what sort of life they're living after they get out of high school, and, you know, the, the level of productivity as citizens of Lowell, all right? Going back to where I started around transition and our obligations around transition, I think that one of the most important measures of the program and something that's really important for us to focus on is how do we build out those transition plans so that we have kids that moving forward put them in the best outcomes. And I think that we have to be flexible in thinking about our practices with that because in Massachusetts, Students who are on IEPs can technically go to school until they're 22 years old, right? And so there's tends to be just a sort of standard practice that you go through your four years of high school, right? And then you move on. And it doesn't have to be that model. And I'm not wedded to whether it should or shouldn't be for any individual student. I think that we have to remember that, all right? And why that's important to me and impactful to all of this conversation from the beginning is because our obligation, all right, 
before that make, they make that change in placement and they start moving on to their adult lives is to do everything we can to prepare them. And if that includes giving them additional time, if that includes building out further partnerships, if that includes the work-based learning model, if that includes continuing to network and get to know the other options that are available both in our own district and our neighboring districts about what can we do to continue to support them, all right? Um, because I think that if we can build up some more robust programming, we can put ourselves in position where we can maximize that. And we're going to have kids that are going to come through, and we're going to have kids that are going to get to that fourth year, and they're ready. And I think that we have other kids that we want to make sure that we take full advantage of all the opportunities for them, okay? Now, going back to where all this started, the questions around the BCBA and the safety of the building, okay? Um, that's really important. It's a priority, and it's going to continue to be a priority for me. And the additional BCBA support that we have, we're prepared to continue to offer the level of support to the building to make sure that they feel safe, all right, as I continue to have conversations with all of the staff to think about the structure. I think that what we have to really think about is what's the most appropriate support for the building? Is it a BCBA that they're needing? Is it somebody who has a strong clinical base? Is it about the community outreach? Is it somebody who focus, who can do the transitional work? Is it about, you know, what, do we, what sort of net results do we get from building out some of these incentives, all right? All the while making sure that we're putting safety at the forefront of everything and everybody, okay? But I think that's going to take um, some time and I think that that's going to take some input from the stakeholders, which is why one of my action steps is to really include all of the stakeholders, people who have a vested interest in the school, to talk about the things that are working and what else can we do to help the program continue to move forward. Thank you very much. You bet. So I know that we have um, Ms. Cuneo who's here. Yeah. Ms. Bizantz, I'm assuming you wanted to. Come to the mic. Sorry, yeah, in order to be able to hear it. <laughs> I'm Carolyn Cooney. I'm the coordinator at the LeBlanc. Um, I just wanted to be here in case there were some questions or if I need some clarifying questions or anything like that. Um, I agree with most of what Mr. Vincente said, if not all of it. Um, I um, just want people to understand, you know, the nature of our students, that um, we're not we try and be a traditional school, but we're not a traditional school. And our kids come to us because they have major um, issues. And, um, you know, although I agree 100% about beefing up the academics um, and getting as many resources as we possibly can, we also have to get the social emotional um, um, well being of our kids in check because for them, the math test isn't the most important thing. Sometimes it's whether it's eating, whether it's, you know, whatever's going on in their life. And, and that's what we really all need to deal with. And one thing I did want to say is the attendance was a focus. And this year I think it's been definitely a struggle. Um, COVID um, has been a huge thing. I still have kids who won't come in because of COVID. But I guess I, what, what I want people to understand is, you know, um, it ebbs and flows who comes in all the time. It's different. So when, you know, Mr. Vincente said, I think he said we average 20 kids. One day it will be this group of kids. Next it will be this group of kids. But understand that I have kids in the hospital. I have kids in DYS. I have kids who are AWOL. I have kids that are in programs. I have kids who are school refusal. I have kids who have left the high school to come to me because they won't come to school. And we've been working diligently to try and get them in school. So, and we've been successful with some kids. So it's, it's a process, I guess is what I want to say. So to me, to just see, oh, only 20 kids came in today, that's not always the case because there's a lot of kids that are having major issues outside. I mean, I could tell you where every one of my students is at this point. Um, and so the, the reason that we were here was the teachers in particular, but I will add myself, there was a, a scare at the LeBlanc and they were really upset. Um, and so some of them came forward. I know Ms. Bizantz was one of them. And um, I think for us, I had had meetings trying to, you know, debrief meetings to pull the team back together. And the one thing that we, as a team, put together was that there was a big difference in that this position 
which is a behavioral person, was no longer with us full time. And that was the one huge caveat. Yes, there's a million other things, whether it be COVID going on, whether it be in person, the nature of the students that are coming in, a lot of different things. I understand that. But that was a huge piece to not have that person there. When I say we're not a traditional school, we have to modify our curriculum. We have to do so many things for our students. We um, individualize everything. I mean, literally, there's 42 individualized plans for some of these kids. Um, and so my teachers really do the best they can. Um, and they do a good job. I mean, we've, in my 11 years, we've graduated 86 kids, which would have been dropouts if we weren't there. Um, but going back to the, 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 the position, currently it's about a 0.7, and yes, there was someone who came over, but it's, it's different in that the whole premise of this building is to build relationships with these students. And when you build the relationships, you're able to do the work with them. And when I don't have someone there that has been there full time, it's difficult. You lose that. The kids don't relate as much. They have to go to someone else. And it's hard. That was the one thing that we pinpointed that was the biggest change. I would love to work on a lot of these initiatives. But in the interim, what do we do? I guess is my question. And you know, the, the, the program since I've been there has been built, built on having a behavioral person in, in involved. I think the district is going towards a different way of using their BCBAs. I understand that. My BCBA, well, it was a person who was a behavior specialist and became a BCBA just with education, which we like to encourage, I would think. But then they went into the BCBA cohort. But that person did all the behavioral stuff, but also had some clinical background. That was her background. So it worked out really well. Um, so I don't know, God. I wasn't expecting to speak, and now my <laughs> mouth was like really dry, so I apologize. But anyway, so I don't know if there's any clarifying question you need for me. I didn't even expect to say all that, and I apologize. So if anyone has any questions, please feel free. Yep, go right ahead, Ms. Rossi. I just wanted to ask, I guess, a clarifying question. When it said the current um, 0.5 BCBA was present all five days, so is that the BCBA that has been there yeah, over time? Yeah, so that, that's the staff member that's been there um, historically. Okay. And the other question is, you know, I noticed, so they don't have a BCBA in the building at all on Tuesdays and alternating Fridays? No, so that so the days that the current 0.5 is at Lowell High School are the days that the additional BCBA is there to be present. So those other days, she's there all the other days. So she's out of the building a couple of the days, and those days are the days that I made sure that we provided the additional supports so that there's always a BCBA present. Yes. Can you say that again? So there are, because the position is split and they offer support to another building, the days that she is not scheduled to be at the LeBlanc school, we have a secondary support that comes to the LeBlanc school to offer the support there so that they always have a BCBA present. So through this process, since the meeting in January, I've put that practice in place to make sure that they continue to have an appropriate level of support at the building, um, given all of the concerns that we had. Ms. Cuno, did you have a... No, I'm just going to explain. Oh, okay. The initial yeah. one was, is it Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday? Okay. But I will say, being at the high school, she does a lot of Zooms and, and meetings during the week. Mm -hmm. And on Monday, she's never there and every other Friday. Okay. okay. So, but Thank you. This person was a dual BCBA clinical. Right. Okay. Okay. Do you have any other questions right now? <laughs> I do, but I don't. I, I guess I, I would just like to say social emotional <clears throat> issues across the district are at an extremely high point. Mm -hmm. And the LeBlanc, I know from working there myself, is extremely needy with, with their needs. So if any support can be given to them more so it's every day in working with the students i think 
if any school in this district needs it mm -hmm. besides all of them it's the LeBlanc <laughs> that's it thank you yep. yes mr. Reddick thank you I'd like to say I agree with that and a point that you made earlier about um, our, our staff having access to the resources and the opportunities um, I would kind of flip that because the way I look at it is it's based on the needs of the students mm -hmm. so the social emotional needs of our only therapeutic school in the district takes precedence over just having access mm -hmm. we've got to look at the needs so um, I think the most important thing for me right now and I would agree this all sounds wonderful mm -hmm. look at the programming looking at afternoon opportunities transportation um, but we need to have that and I don't think it was just necessarily a 0.5 BCBA and then we're going to add another 0.5 or another 0.25 I think it was that person mm -hmm. who had the relationships and you talked on, on one of your slides about the current staffing mm -hmm. my understanding is the previous staffing prior to the pandemic mm -hmm. was this full person full-time why would you split a person that has relationships with the students mm -hmm. and have that person go part-time to another school and then bring in another split person mm -hmm. when we all know how important the relationships are mm -hmm. um, my feeling and I feel very strongly about this I would like to as we're doing this other very important work to provide the resources to the LeBlanc that we keep the staffing that no staffing suffers through the pandemic we all know the needs across the district have grown we've poured resources into the fair student funding approach of budgeting um, we don't go backwards in terms of the staffing model if there is going to be a change down the road based on your continued research and working with the stakeholders I'm fine with discussing that mm -hmm. but for right now we're heading into budget season mm -hmm. we need to know that we're gonna have a full-time person and not a split person mm -hmm. because I it seems counterintuitive uh, and I, I'm talking really fast I know because we've spent uh, 45 minutes here and we haven't even gone on to the next thing and we need to leave um, when you talk about attendance I know this is a popular these are our most vulnerable kids right we know what works in terms of attendance interventions we had great success at the high school overall but it, when we put the resources in so to be revisiting that absolutely mm -hmm. are the resources there we had a grant I know that money ran out but we know how to do it we know how to engage the kids so a lot of this sounds very positive to me but when you you mentioned after April vacation it might change I'm not really keen on this splitting of this other person I think we should have the person who has the relationship with the students there full time like we did before and I think that the resource officer having a, a plan like he's going to go by the school a couple of times a week however it works out that would also I think go a long way again based on the relationships mm -hmm. um, and I'm not even on the subcommittee so I can't make a motion yeah. but I do feel strongly that this is the way we should be going okay Ms. Thompson so um, just in thinking about you know special education in general, quite honestly, it's obviously layered, right? It's not a one a one size fits all. I think that um, I tend toward I tend to lean towards what committee member um, Dorothy just spoke about. However, I do wonder if the reasoning for that speaking about this being about our children, everybody doesn't get along with every single person that offers counseling or offers support. So I'm curious as to the reasoning that you may have done the split. Is it because potentially culturally there's a cultural sensitivity that that other person may not have with the student or a rapport that they may have or you're looking to see or check that out because again one of the concerns that I had was in you mentioning all the professional developments that are being done one of the professional developments that needs to be considered for our students is the cultural component of it so the diversity component of it and making sure that that's also really secured and and um and thought about so that's all i have to add in addition to what my um my fellow colleagues just mentioned that's something that i was curious about sure so <clears throat> my first action step was to make sure that the building was staffed to address the safety concern okay the position of BCBA, Board Certified Behavior Analyst, has a very specific practice. It's not a traditional clinical position. 
which is what the uh, 0.5 who's been there, or maybe it's 0.7, she's working under the guise of a BCBA, all right? Now, in the past, prior to my leadership of the department, there was a practice where there was a behavior specialist at the LeBlanc School. That transition to BCBA, I know that the staff member earned the BCBA and became a member of the BCBA cohort, all right? How that transitioned into the decision, I don't have all of that historical information. But my point in all of this, okay, is that I believe that we have to ask ourselves what is the most appropriate support for the building. I don't know that it is just the BCBA. The BCBA has a job description. They have a certain role. They have to follow their guidance that they get from LABA, who their licensing board is. So I wanna make sure that I'm thoughtful about that because there is a clinical component to all of these things. The outreach, the, uh, you know, the crisis management, you know, a lot of the work that's done around social work, there's social skills groups that happen at the building. That's not traditionally the work of a BCBA. So my question ultimately in talking to the stakeholders is long term, okay, ultimately, what's the most appropriate support for the building. I don't know if it's a BCBA, all right? And not because I do or don't want to give them a BCA, BCBA, it's because I want to make sure that we're offering the most appropriate support, the people with the right qualifications and who can do all that. And I recognize that they had a staff member who was there in a, in a certain capacity, and she's currently working in a different capacity now, all right? So I wanted to make sure that we secured the safety of the building and make sure that they have appropriate supports. Um, if there's guidance that's offered that we need to do something that's different that's in the best interest of the students, we will certainly do that. What I said to Ms. Cuneo is I want to have a conversation with her this week about what happens after April vacation and again, fully prepared to offer them a full level of support in the building, whether that's a split person or whether that model looks something different. I want to make sure that we're offering not just support to the school, the right kind of support to the school. And all of these things universally impact what's moving forward, okay? As somebody who has, you know, a personal investment in the department, who worked with many of these kids as their teacher, as their principal, and for somebody who's been working with this population myself for a very long time, I didn't just do all of these things because I think that, you know, I wanted to just do this big robust response. All of these things are impactful to helping our students move forward, all right? all of these things are going to be helpful to making sure that the kids come to school. And we also need to make sure that we're meeting all of our obligations, making sure that we're meeting our obligations about how their IEPs are being written, making sure that we're meeting all of our obligations about transition. I wanna make sure that I look at everything so that we can make sure that we as a public 766 school that we've done all of the different things that we need to do. That's my goal for the Little Blake School of, you know, across the board for everybody. Excellent. So I think one of the things that um, that we need to consider is that the LeBlanc School is, it's a very small school. It's very specialized uh, and it's not unreasonable that it would have different needs than kind of the, the strictly written out job descriptions that may exist for a BCA versus a BCBA mm -hmm. as we toss around sure. acronyms. Um, so what I would recommend, the reality is, is that this the subcommittee, this, the school committee, really can't weigh in on this again until budget time. Mm -hmm. um, so this would be the opportunity for staff, for uh, the, the, um, the other groups that you're gonna be working with, uh, stakeholders, um, to be having these conversations. Yep. And I don't think it's an unreasonable thing, despite the fact that this specific individual has gone on to further her education. In my mind, that makes her more valuable even if she is kind of doing a quasi role as both the BCA and the BCBA, mm -hmm. that there should be some flexibility within our kind of uh, HR assignments that allows us to have someone who may be extra qualified still doing some of the frontline work. Mm -hmm. uh, and it seems like that's kind of where a lot of this, the friction is coming in this. So again, our role is not gonna come up again until the budget season that gives you some time to speak with the principal, speak with staff, speak with everyone else who's kind of um, connected with the school and come up with a response. But I would say that it is legitimate uh, in terms of a argument that 
in such a small, specialized um, school that there could be some roles that are slightly different than the way they're envisioned in other school communities. Mm -hmm. So that is just my recommendation to okay. you and yours as you begin this process. Okay. Okay. Right. Um, I think we could take that as um, uh, take that as a report of progress by Ms. Del Rossi, seconded by Ms. Thompson, right? Thought so. Yes. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Thank you very much. Uh, right, so we are now faced with eight minutes for we really have to be out by six. We, they're standing, they're trying to come in. Um, commission, oh, um, one of the commissioners, uh, I don't know which one, conservation maybe. They've Thank you so much it. for inviting us back to share some updates on the LHS Performing Arts Wellness Program, specifically around the Sexuality and Reproduction Unit of Study. Since our last meeting with you, we took the opportunity to solidify our partnership with Teen Block, which is a part of the Lowell Community Health Center. Teen Block has committed to working with LHS to offer their Making Proud Choices curriculum in all of our health and wellness classes beginning in school year 22-23. A full overview of this three-week curriculum is included in your packet. Additionally, health and performing arts teachers at Lowell High School collaborated with Ruth Ogembo from Teen Block on March 24th to begin aligning the health and wellness curriculum, ensuring consistency across all classes. This collaborative work was fruitful and was met with the full support of the performing arts and health teachers at Lowell High School who collaborated that day. From that working session, teachers made plans for next steps, which includes one full professional development day and two half days. This will provide time for performing arts teachers to collaborate with their health teacher peers around the development of a final curriculum map for these performing arts wellness courses. Stephanie Salvaggio, Jill Rothschild, and I are happy to answer any additional questions that you might have. And we're also happy to share those final curriculum maps upon completion for, for review. Um, but before we take any questions on this now, I'd like to invite Dr. Rothschild to present on the physical education update. Hi everyone, I can um, be quick as well. So I don't believe this was part of the subcommittee meeting um, formally, but it came up as a question. Um, so I did include information in the memo with regards to the PE requirement and the state requirement. Um, so by law, we are required to teach physical education as a required subject for all students and all grades. So we do have to teach it nine through 12. Um, DESE also will not allow um, for sports, whether it's um, intramural or um, as part of a uh, structured activity for um, LHS to count as part of that learning time. Where we do have flexibility is in the um, amount of minutes we assign to physical education. Um, so at present, what that means is uh, we do have some flexibility as we continue to look at our PE requirements as well as our health and wellness program and we start to move towards a more uh, comprehensive health and wellness program. So work that is uh, beginning right now in motion is our PE department chair. Um, that was a new position Position this year and we are moving uh, for that individual to transition to that role. We'll work uh, closely with Stephanie Savaggio to assess the current classes that we have and make some recommendations as we are able to move forward in subsequent years. Um, but we can continue to make uh, the committee aware of any um, recommendations or changes that we're examining. So my understanding that really because of the DESE requirements, we're simply not able to eliminate the phys ed component, whether for athletes or yes. otherwise. Yes, yep, exactly. So we do have, we are required um, to um, uh, not only offer it, but make it a requirement each year. What some schools do is they embed their PE within their health and wellness program. So they combine some elements of health um, and physical education to be able to meet that requirement. Um, so again, that's, it's more studying of uh, you know, surrounding schools and making recommendations. Uh, we're also audited every, it's, I think it's approximately every six years to make sure we're meeting that requirement. Um, I do not know offhand when Lowell High School is due to have that next audit. I spoke with a former um, athletic director um, and he says we have not been in about five years, so it's going to be within the next two. But I can get that specific date for you. Okay. Any other questions? Yep. 
I guess my question is, would health classes be eliminated completely? No, I'm not suggesting that at all. I'm just, I'm speaking to how some health, are you talking about with PE or are you talking about with the fine arts? I'm talking about, you have this health and wellness program through Teen Block now. Yes. Right? So in turn, is this the only way uh, health will be offered or will no. students have the choice yeah, to so still take a health class? Absolutely. So we are not suggesting in any way, shape, or form that health A or health B be eliminated. Um, those are still within our course catalog. Those are still classes that are being taught. Um, and if, uh, you know, as we're kind of also coming into budget season, we're looking at our course requests and we're also making sure that we have the appropriate amount of staff to be able to teach those classes because they are typically um, uh, highly enrolled. So that is not a being eliminated. What we are doing and with uh, what Ms. DeVizo was speaking to was taking um, uh, taking the health curriculum and intertwining it with our current fine arts curriculum. Um, so, for example, in the way that um, physical education now counts for show choir and some other classes, we're doing the same with health and we're making sure that we're hitting the same standards. With teen block, as you mentioned, having them come in and replace, they're not replacing, they're just going to be teaching a unit and that unit is going to be taught both within health A and health B. Um, so for students who are not taking the fine arts as well as within the fine arts. And that actually is a partnership we had um, many years ago. I think it was about five or six years. They would come in and they would also partner um, specifically with the grade nine courses to teach health day. So if a student chooses just to take the fine arts health. Yep. Right? And not health A or health B. The part that concerns me is that there's no talk in here about um, vaping, you know, and there's no mm -hmm. um, of the dangers, and, and so many of our kids do it, and um, substance abuse and mental health, there's mm -hmm. no discussion about any of that. So um, this memo, this memo with... Um, so I'll let, let Mr. Vizo come in, but this is specific to address the concerns around the sexual education uh, unit within the health curriculum, but um, Jessica can talk to the other elements. I'm actually, and I really apologize, but we can hear the crowd outside that is waiting to come in and it's six o'clock. Um, so I'm very sorry that the first topic had taken up the time and I hate to ask you to come back, um, but I really don't want to give this short shrift and just kind of try to power through it. So. I'm With happy great to come back apology. and um, to, to fully address the questions that you raised because this was really in response only to one unit of study, which is a three-week unit. Um, but these classes will cover and fully encompass all of the standards that are taught in both Health A and Health B. And that's what these additional PD working sessions will be used for. And so the health teachers already sat down with the performing arts teachers to look at their maps and figure out how we could cover those standards um, during the 40 week school year. And so they have a plan in place for how they're gonna do it. Now they need to take the, that time in those working sessions to actually align those maps. So if we could wait to, um, until after they've had a chance to work on actually expanding out those maps, I would love to be able to present to you um, something that's a fuller picture of what the, the, the course full, of study will look including like. Including all the other topics. I'd like to be able to share the kind of topics okay. what helping the curriculum map versus you know, how that's going to be okay. I'm just wondering um, if we could discuss this at our meeting Wednesday night because uh, I have a lot of concerns and questions about why we're even taking health A and B, why we're not having our, our dance students do it, like, and what, how you can match three weeks of, the, of sex education block with a performing arts student with, uh, you know, years of work on health A and health B with a teacher with a, again that relationship so I mean I don't know I just we we don't have enough time you're gonna move forward down this road when I'm not sure uh, this is a path we should be going on and I I think with the phys ed piece we know districts that are doing it all over the place like why can't we be uh, substituting gym they're not substituting gym for sports in other communities
Okay, so I'm gonna, um, we'll be reconvening. I, I'm assuming we're not gonna get anything new on for Wednesday, but I think it would make the most sense to bring the subcommittee back together in the next probably two weeks. Uh, I know all your PD won't be done by then, but it can at least get some of these questions answered. Sure. So again, with great apologies for everyone who had, had come this evening. Um, a motion to adjourn by Ms. Del Rossi, seconded by Ms. Thompson. Yes. There you go. <laughs> motion passes. Thank you all very much. Bye, everyone. Bye, Bye Stacey. Stacey. Thank you.